All right, welcome to History 1302 um, lectures again. We're back in business. Um, it's taken me a little bit of time to learn that this even exists, that I can actually record over the PowerPoints and get them loaded onto our Blackboard, but, um, but, but I think I've got it, I think I've got it under control. So uh, we're gonna give it a shot. Um, again, keep in touch with your folders. I'll send you a new schedule on a weekly basis. Uh, there will be um, uh, an assignment due at the end of the week, but, um, but in a sense, we're kind of back to normal. I'm going to be lecturing, um, and you're going to be taking notes just like you do in class. All right, so we're going to we're going to begin today to start looking at the um, the events that will lead to the outbreak of World War II, or what becomes World War II in Europe in 1939. Uh, the United States will not be involved in that war until 1941. Uh, but we first need to understand the term fascist, fascism. Now, fascism is a system of government. Uh, democracy is a system of government. Communism is a system of government. Fascism is a system of government that, um, that is characterized by authoritarian leadership um, and extremely nationalistic right-wing um, philosophies and government. Um, Fascism begins in the 20th century in Italy, when in World War I, Benito Mussolini comes to power. Um, Spain will fall under fascist control in the 1930s after a civil war there. Uh, and Germany, of course, with the ascension of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party to power, will institute a system of fascism in that country as well. Um, fascism, the nationalism that's involved in fascism it essentially includes the feelings um, that one's nation is superior to all others, uh, that, the, that the people of that nation who are bound together by a certain ethnicity uh, or language or, uh, um, or, or culture, uh, that they make up the, uh, uh, the, the true uh, citizens, the true people of that nation. In, uh, in, in, in Hitler's point of view, it's the Aryan people, white people of Germanic heritage, um, who, um, and essentially Christian, who, um, who are the, the, the true master race uh, of the world in his point of view. Um, and it, 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 the idea that we have in America, that we are bound together as Americans by rule of law or by shared values, that doesn't exist in a fascist system. Um, Again, it, it, it's based on race, it's based on ethnicity, it's based on language, culture. Um, but, uh, but as we'll see, of course, in, in, uh, in Germany, uh, anyone who is not white, German, ethnic, Christian, um, they, they become the enemy uh, for, for Hitler. Um, fascism is opposed to democracy, it's opposed to communism. It, it generally ends up becoming a totalitarian state, a one-party state. There may be elections, but you only have the one choice to vote for. Um, in, in, in Germany's case, it'll be the Nazis. Um, and in a fascist system, um, violence carried out by the government um, against people is not necessarily a negative. Um, a strong police state um, in a sense, can be used to achieve national greatness, uh, national, you know, the, the power of the government to rule all. Um, and in fact, um, in a fascist system, um, you know, greatness, as Hitler would say, in a sense, um, relies on the uh, relies on the uh, the rebirth, in a sense, of um, of the of the race, the ethnicity of the Aryan people. Um, in order to make the, the nation great and powerful. Now, to understand um, what's going on in Germany in the 1930s, it's necessary for us to take a look at, uh, at Adolf Hitler, um, the, uh, the leader of this National Socialist Workers' Party um, that, uh, that becomes known as the Nazi party, which is kind of an abbreviation for the way that those words sound in German. Um, so let's understand a bit about Hitler. Uh, Adolf Hitler, um, was born in Austria in 1889. Um, Austria is just south of Germany. 
Austrians are Germanic people, uh, similar heritage and, and, and history to, to Germans themselves. Uh, the town that Hitler was born in is, 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 a, is a town in Austria, just, just south of the German border. Um, Hitler's education ended when he dropped out of school at the age of 16. He wanted to be an artist, but he failed to get into the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, Vienna is Austria's capital. Um, his work was simply not good enough. So when he failed to, to get into art school, um, he bummed around Vienna for a couple of years, homeless essentially, uh, making a living by drawing um, pictures on postcards to sell to tourists. Um, and it was, in, it was in Vienna that he first came into contact with, um, with the anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish ideas that will, um, that will come to characterize uh, Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Now, in 1913, um, Hitler moved from Vienna to Munich, Germany. Um, it's in southern Germany, in the German state of Bavaria. Um, when World War I breaks out then, Hitler joined the German army. And there he kind of found a home. Um, he loved the military discipline. He was intensely patriotic and supportive of the German cause in World War I. Um, he received several citations for, uh, for bravery during the war. He was wounded twice. Um, and he called his time in the military, and I, and I quote, the greatest and most unforgettable time of my earthly existence. Now, when the war was over, of course, with the German defeat and the, uh, the terms of the Treaty of Versailles blaming, blaming Germany for the war, um, Hitler stayed in Munich and there he became involved with this extreme right-wing, anti-Jewish, nationalistic political party known as the National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazi Party. Uh, the party was very small, and Hitler pretty quickly rose to power in the party, primarily because he was a very effective speaker. Um, he, um, he, he could... Uh, he, he, he could hold an audience really in the palm of his hands. Um, and, and he was offering some very simple solutions to the very complex problems facing Germany in the 1920s. So let's take a look at those problems. After World War I, um, a democracy was established in, uh, in Germany. This democracy was not very strong, real frankly. Um, I think with all the resentment brewing in Germany over the war um, and, and the other economic issues that we'll talk about in just a minute, this democracy never really had much of a chance for success. Um, but what we're gonna see in the 1920s is as a very intense nationalism growing in Germany, uh, really based around the intense resentment that the German people had toward the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and, uh, and in Germany, that nationalization took the form more and more of a glorification of Germany, the glorification of the German people. Um, you know, consider they've been blamed for causing the uh, World War I, the worst war in world history. Uh, they have been assessed enormously high reparations to the Allies. Um, they've had their military reduced to a token force. They've lost territory, their colonies. Um, in some ways, you can almost, you know, the, the rhetoric of German greatness in some ways was a psychological reaction to, to, that, to, to that treaty in some ways, to that German loss in the war. Now, the second problem facing Germany in the 1920s, though, was economic. Um, because incredibly high inflation took hold of the nation's economy in the early 1920s. Um, the German mark, like a dollar, right? The German mark um, by the middle of the 1920s was worth maybe one two thousand five hundredths of what it had been before the war. So if we put that in, in context, um, if a product had cost five marks before the war began, uh, in the middle of this inflation, that product now cost about 12,500 marks. Um, so, so essentially the, the German currency, the, the mark was, was, was worthless. 
Um, and, and, in a, and, and as Germany began to kind of pull itself out of uh, that inflation near the end of the 1920s, then you've got the worldwide depression that hits. And, and Germany is hit by that depression just as all other industrialized nations were. Um, so in some ways, I guess we can say that Germany is ready for a demagogue. Germany is, 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 is ripe, really, for, um, for the kind of, of leader like Hitler that uses emotion and prejudice and fear to gain power. Because his speeches, as I said, appeal to all levels of, of German society. He's going to exploit that German resentment of the Treaty of Versailles. He promises to unite all the German people once again in a united and new fatherland, um, a new German nation. Um, he, he identifies scapegoats. He identifies groups that can be blamed for Germany's problems, their economic problems, um, the, 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 the Treaty of Versailles. And one of his most, one of his primary scapegoats are Jews. Um, Jews, he said, are the problems in, 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 in Europe. Jews are the ones who have caused the economic crises. Uh, it, was, it was a vast Jewish worldwide conspiracy that, that punished Germany at the end of World War I. Um, and, and, and by finding someone to blame, someone that, that historically, Jews have historically kind of been um, scapegoated and, and, and discriminated against throughout history, um, you can convince many people to follow someone like Adolf Hitler. So, so let's consider. Um, Adolf Hitler came to power in a legitimate election in 1932, 1933, sorry. Um, now, Previously, about 10 years earlier, he had tried, the Nazis had tried to seize control of the, uh, uh, the fledgling democracy in, in Germany. Um, it was a failed coup, a failed revolution. Um, Hitler was tried and convicted on charges of treason in 1923, imprisoned for about nine months. Um, but after he was released from prison, he starts trying to plot and figure how the Nazis can come to power legitimately. So in 1932, Hitler ran to be the president of, of Germany, running against uh, Paul von Hindenburg. Uh, Hindenburg won the election, but the Nazi party won about a third of the seats in the German parliament, the Reichstag. Um, Hindenburg then appointed Hitler to be chancellor of Germany. Think of it like a prime minister, simply because his party had so much support. And to be honest, the establishment German politicians, they thought they could control Hitler. They thought by, by giving him this post that, that they would be able then to kind of move him into the establishment. They would be able to, um, to, to, to in a sense, to, to, to moderate his, his, his extreme views um, and, uh, and not allow him or not allow the Nazis to gain, to gain more and more power throughout the country. Um, however, what we find is that in just a couple of months after he became Chancellor of Germany, still in 1933, uh, there was a fire in the Parliament building, the Reichstag, and, and Hitler, Hitler immediately blamed communists for that fire. Now, it's kind of still unclear exactly how that fire actually did begin. Uh, there, there are many historians who believe the Nazis probably said it themselves, uh, but, but Hitler declares a national emergency um, after this fire. Um, the parliament gave him full emergency, essentially dictatorial powers to deal with this problem, to, to handle this um, problem of this alleged communist uprising. Um, and uh, in a sense, um, that's, that's when you see Germany now becoming an authoritarian state. Hitler now having emergency powers to to begin to to um, uh, to to uh, sorry hold on a sec okay to begin to um, suspend civil liberties 
to, uh, to, to essentially call off elections. I mean, there'll be elections, but you only had one choice. It was the Nazis to vote for. Um, and uh, essentially, again, making Adolf Hitler the, the dictator uh, of Germany. And as soon as the Nazis have that full power then, we are going to start to see uh, them passing laws designed to, um, to take rights away from, from Jews, um, from, from, any, uh, from, from blacks living in Germany, from, from, from gypsies, Roma people, uh, in order to, uh, to begin his, um, as they would, as the Nazis called it, this, this cleansing uh, of the German nation. So, 1934, uh, we're going to start to see the Nazis begin to kill off their enemies. You're going to see state-sponsored, um, state-sanctioned, state, state-approved state violence against anyone who was seen as a, as a political opponent of the Nazis. Um, in uh, uh, one event known as the Night of the Long Ni Knives, excuse me, um, there were about a hundred um, of Hitler's political enemies that are killed, um, about a thousand um, arrested and imprisoned, and you'll see the, the first of the German um, concentration camps built outside of Munich at Dachau um, as a place to imprison those political opponents of Adolf Hitler. Uh, in other words, the Nazis began to silence their critics, to kill them off, to imprison them, uh, to, to try again to, uh, to gain full and complete power uh, in the country. In 1935, Germany begins to power past a set of laws known as the Nuremberg Laws that were anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish race laws. Uh, the Nuremberg's laws, Nuremberg Laws prohibited marriage uh, and, and sexual intercourse between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, the laws declared that only ethnic Germans were citizens, not Jews, uh, not gypsies, not blacks, not anyone who was not an ethic ethnically sure, as they would call it, German person, that, that anyone living in Germany who was not considered, uh, who, who was not an ethnic German, basically had no more civil rights. Uh, they, they, their citizenship were, rights were, um, were abolished. Um, and one of the results of that is you start, is, is you see more and more not Jews and non-Jews uh, who are no longer socializing. Uh, Non-Jews stopped shopping at Jewish owned stores and businesses. Um, you start to see a, a general shunning uh, in a sense of Jewish businesses, Jewish people. Uh, laws were passed prohibiting Jews from holding certain types of jobs. Uh, Jews could no longer hold government jobs, for example. They could no longer work in, in the medical field. Uh, Jews in, in Germany could no longer work in, uh, in schools or colleges. Um, if Jews wanted to leave Germany, they had to give the German government 90% of their wealth, um, sort of an exit tax, I guess. Um, which, um, uh, and I think at that point, the, the Nazis hoped that Jews would simply leave Germany. Um, and, and those who could afford to, they, they are going to go. But most can't afford to just up and leave and go to another country. Where were they going to go? Remember, the United States has quotas in, in, in place. You know, only a certain number of, of people can come to the country from certain places. You know, we are going to see the, the United States um, turning away many Jews who are attempting to escape to escape and come to the United States. In 1939, we're going to see an event known as Kristallnacht, uh, Night of Broken Glass, November the 9th, 1938, when the Nazi government will carry out a coordinated, uh, coordinated police attacks uh, throughout the nation on German homes. Um, hospitals, synagogues, cemeteries, schools, businesses. Um, an estimated 7,000 uh, buildings are destroyed in, in this, uh, during this, this night. Uh, 1,400 synagogues and cemetery, cemeteries are destroyed, um, burned, uh, tombstones are toppled. Uh, again, this is, this is state-sanctioned violence. About 30,000 Jewish men were arrested that evening, that night, and taken to concentration camps. 
Uh, and, and again, you are going to see more concentration camps being built uh, to house all of these prisoners. At the same time, during the course of the 1930s, the Nazi government is, is carrying out certain actions that were designed to build the military and uh, power of, of Germany to try to, uh, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, to begin to, to rebuild its military. Um, so, so we are going to see increased military spending, um, increased military recruiting in Germany. Um, and, and actually, that increased government spending is going to create a lot of jobs. Um, Germany is going to be is going to get out of the depression much quicker than a lot of other nations, simply because of all the jobs that are created uh, by the government as they as they put these plans into place. So, a bigger military. We're going to you know, rebuild the the U-boats, the, the the airplanes, the the tanks, etc. Um, second, we're going to see the Nazi government beginning a very ambitious road construction project. Uh, again, putting a lot of people back to work, building um, were essentially freeways. Um, but but it, it, if people had looked closely, what they would see is that those roads were leading to the borders of nations, of other nations. Uh, and, and they're going to be, in a sense, the infrastructure by which the German army begins to move to take over their neighbors. Um, the Nazis also gave the German people a certain confidence that uh, a certain they gave the German people a certain confidence. Uh, I think that that essentially was was designed to to compensate, I guess, for the for the humiliation that many Germans felt over that Treaty of Versailles, but. But, but let's understand that this confidence was built on the persecution of Jews. They were built on the persecution of anyone who wasn't considered an Aryan ethnic German. Um, you're going to see book burning in Germany. You're going to see um, uh, attempts at mass conformity by law. Um, you, you did not dare question what was going on. Um, it, it was the beginning of a totalitarian state. Now, by 1937, Adolf Hitler had, had come up with a plan to acquire new territory for Germany. All right, after Austria, Hitler next set his sights on a region in Czechoslovakia, this region here, this border region right here, known as the Czech Sudetenland. And check your lecture outlines for the spelling of that. This was a border region, of Czechoslovakia, bordering Germany, um, in which you've got a lot of ethnically German people living there. Um, and, and so Hitler wants to, to again, to, to incorporate that Sudetenland into the greater German nation. Now, the, Czech, the Czechoslovakian government, they're, they're not happy about this. They don't want to just hand over a portion of their territory to, to Hitler. Um, but Czechoslovakia was a relatively young nation. It was only about 20 years old. It had been part of Austria-Hungary during uh, before World War One. Sorry, that is my bird who squawks. I'm sorry to me, he's going to be a, probably going to be a feature of these lectures. Um, but Czechoslovakia was not strong enough to be able to repel the German army if it wanted just to come in there and take over. If, if they were going to fight the Germans, they were going to need help. They were going to need help from, say, Britain. Or France. But here's what we need to understand. Britain nor France wanted another war with Germany. Uh, they simply believe that another war with Germany would be disastrous. Uh, and so Britain, France, and Germany convened a peace conference. That peace conference was held in September of 1938 in Munich, Germany. So it's called the Munich Peace Conference. And there at the Munich Peace Conference, they're going to give Hitler what he wants. It's called appeasement. Uh, Germany and France agreed that if Hitler promises to go no further, if he promises to stop with the acquisition of the Sudetenland, that he can have the Sudetenland without resistance. Now, 
looking back on this, this is a huge mistake. Um, but, but frankly, the policy of appeasement had been how the Western democracies of Britain and France had been dealing with all of this. Uh, they, they figure if they could just calm down Hitler, if they could just give him a little bit of what he wants, that, that he'll stop. Again, they don't see the threat yet. Um, Britain and France have suffered horribly in World War I. They are convinced that another European war would mean the end of European Shh. civilization as they know it. Um, and, and so the Czechs, the Czech government um, allowed the, uh, the Sudetenland then to be taken over by the, by the Nazis, again, in return for a promise that Hitler go no further that they stop, they stop taking control of territory outside of their own nation. Nazis are going to uh, occupy Paris. Adolf Hitler goes to Paris to have his picture taken in front of the Eiffel Tower. I mean, think about this. I mean, when, when the Nazis occupy Paris, occupy France, in a sense, for Hitler, it's like, it's like defeating the Treaty of Versailles. Paris had been where that treaty had been negotiated. Um, with, with the Nazis taking Paris, then in a sense, he feels that he, is, that he has you know, avenged um, that he, is, he has avenged Germany of, of the humiliation of that Treaty of Versailles. Um, that France represents the treaty to Hitler. So, so this, was, this was an important step forward for the Nazis. However, as we'll see. All right, with uh, most of Western Europe uh, under German occupation then, uh, in the 1940s, only one European nation was really left to fight Germany, and that was Great Britain. Um, now, now the Germans, in, beginning in 1940 and into 1941, uh, they're going to begin to bomb Britain relentlessly, really, uh, day in, day out, um, during, in what's known as the Battle of Britain. But, uh, but Britain remained strong. Uh, Britain used its air force to uh, to fight um, the the, uh, uh, the the German air force. Uh, Hitler and and Germany also sorry Britain also has the strength of their prime minister behind them. Uh, the British prime minister Winston Churchill seen here. Um, he is key to keeping Britain strong. Um, Britain in a sense fighting the Germans alone. Um, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very famous speech arguing that, uh, that they, the British, uh, we shall fight on the seas and in the oceans. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Now, Hitler's bombing of Germany really was an attempt to soften up the British for an eventual German invasion. But let us know that invasion will never happen. Britain will be able to fight. Britain will be able to defend its island. However, but however, in June of 1941, Adolf Hitler is going to make his biggest mistake of the war. In June of 1941, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. Forget the non-aggression pact, right? Uh, Hitler wants territory. He needs Lebensraum, right? Uh, and so with this invasion then of the Soviet Union, and you see how far the Germans are able to get over the next four years as this war uh, continues. Uh, but with that invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, the Soviet Union declares war on Germany, and they join the Allies. 
to fight. He joined with Britain and France to fight Germany. So now Hitler has a two-front war to deal with. He's going to have to be fighting in the west of, Germ of, of Europe and in the east. And as we're going to see, the it, Germ fighting, fighting the Russians on the eastern front will weaken Germany significantly. Again, this is the biggest mistake of the war for Adolf Hitler. All right, so what is the United States doing while Europe goes to war? The United States is trying to be neutral. Even before the war began in Europe in 1939, the United States Congress had begun to pass a series of neutrality acts that were designed to keep the United States out of this conflict, if it happened. Um, before the war began in 1939, Congress had already passed an arms embargo which essentially meant that the United States would not sell weapons to either side if war began in Europe. They simply didn't want to be involved. Uh, the United States Congress um, passed a law banning Americans from traveling on the ships of warring nations. Uh, so if any Americans died because they were traveling on British ships this time around, the United States wasn't gonna go to war over them. They had warned them, right? We told you not to travel on those ships of warring nations. So, uh, sorry, if you die, we're not going to go to war. Um, Congress passed a law banning Americans from uh, the American government and American banks from loaning money to any warring nation, um, from extending credit to any warring nation. Um, but we should note that American businesses did see a chance to make some money from this war. Um, so Congress will pass what they called cash carry, uh, which said that uh, American businesses could sell goods other than weapons to a warring nation, just as long as that nation paid for those goods in cash and carrying them over to their own country and their own ships. In other words, you know, we're not going to give you credit and uh, we're not going to put the American American ships out there to bring you those products uh, for fear they'll be attacked by Germany. So, you know, this is a way American business can make a little money from the war, but, but still keep the United States from becoming involved. Now, we need to understand that Franklin Roosevelt was not stupid that Franklin Roosevelt saw the threat of Adolf Hitler, especially after the Germans began invading their neighbors. Um, Roosevelt is most concerned right now, though, about Britain, uh, because as, as Europe is falling to the Germans, he fears that if Britain is occupied by the Nazis, if, if Britain falls to Germany, that the United States could then be in danger. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's not that far across the North Atlantic to North America. Um, and, and who says that water is going to keep the Germans from, uh, from deciding to, to extend the war um, into, into the Americas? Um, so, so Roosevelt wants to aid the British. Roosevelt wants to help arm the British to give them, to get them the weapons that they need in order to keep fighting the Germans uh, so that Britain will not be will not be occupied. Problem is, he doesn't have the support of the American people to do this. Um, Americans are extremely isolationist. They do not want anything to do with this foreign war. He simply does not have enough support to be able to aid the British um, as that war breaks out in 1939. This will change, however, with the election of 1940. In November of 1940, Franklin Roosevelt won a third term as the American president. No president had ever even run for a third term before. It all uh, been kind of held in check by George Washington's example of a two-term president. Um, but in 1940, uh, with, the, with the world at war, uh, the Democratic Party could think of no better candidate than Franklin Roosevelt, the man who had brought the nation through, through the Depression. He agreed to run again 
and he won. He won a third term. Now, Roosevelt had campaigned um, during that election on a promise to aid the British, uh, to help arm the British so that they could uh, continue to fight to fight the Germans. Remember, he is very much concerned that if Britain falls to the Nazis, the United States could be in danger. So after winning that third term, essentially the approval of the American people um, to, to act, in 1941, Roosevelt is going to institute a policy of Lend-Lease in order to aid the Allies. Lend-Lease specifically says the United States government can sell or lend or lease weapons to any nation considered vital to the defense of the United States. And that's important. The U.S. government can sell or lend or lease weapons to any nation deemed vital, important to the defense of the United States. That meant Britain. That meant Britain. It meant the United States is going to be able now to arm the British, to get them the planes and the tanks and the weapons that they need to continue their fight against Germany. Um, again, Britain now is vital to the defense of the United States. Um, now, the British are still going to have to send their ships to the United States to pick up those weapons. Uh, but Roosevelt is going to um, authorize the American Navy to escort those British ships um, with those weapons back to Britain. And, and that means there will be some fighting between the American Navy and the, and the German U-boats. But, but not enough to change America's um, opinion about whether or not to become involved in this war officially. Uh, Lend-Lease is, you know, is, is an early break with the idea of neutrality. Um, you know, the United States can stay officially neutral but still help Britain, but it's going to take a third party. It's going to take another nation uh, uh, for, for the United States, for the American people to, uh, to, to understand and to, and to accept um, involvement in, in this new world war. Now, let me also note that when the Soviet Union was invaded by Germany, the United States extended Lend-Lease privileges to the Soviets as well. Uh, so, so the United States is doing what they can to help the Allies, the British Soviets, um, but not, but not, at least not yet, going to war with Germany. That, however, is coming. So...